That's my superpower. That's when I turn into the Hulk is that if, if you're giving me nothing, I will have for my own pure enjoyment. Yeah. 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 Just make your life absolute hell for the next 10 minutes <laughs> purely so that I can come back and tell you guys about it later. It's like, yeah, no, I made the marketing director for cry or <laughs> just, you know, pick, pick a random brand or something. I just, I absolutely love it. Hi and hello Arkanaut fans and welcome to another episode of the Arkanaut Records. We're calling in from Denmark. We're here in Copenhagen in the pit where the magic happens with Anders Brandt and James Thompson. Today we're going to be diving into the importance of contacts in the watchmaking industry. If you've listened to Arkanaut Records before, you will know that we like to go off the beaten track and dig into the minutiae of running a watch brand. If you haven't, please go back and listen to the previous episodes. They're all there for you on your favorite podcast platform. Let's start today today by asking you, James, what was your first contact with the watchmaking industry? Good Lord. Actually, you know what? The very first person I ever met before I had done even a scrap of any work in the industry was actually uh, Anish. Watch Anish. No way. Yeah. I had come over for Salon QP with um, a couple of the English Bell and Ross enthusiasts. Uh, Pierce Berry and uh, the late great legendary Simon Cudd, of course, oh, and we were we were going to go out to a pub and meet up with a couple of friends. I think it was also Oliver Knowles who was running the Hublot Boutique, I think on on Regent Street or something like that. Doesn't matter. Um, and Oliver had brought a couple of buddies with him, and one of them was this this guy Anish. Of course, he didn't say hi. I'm Watch Anish. He just said hi. I'm Anish. You know, nice to meet you. And I had a fantastic chat with the guy. Had no idea who the hell he was. He had no idea who the hell I was, because who the hell was I? Am I? And kind of, it was like a couple of days later when I think he like posted a couple pictures of just, or reposted something, a picture of he and I sitting at a pub having a pint or something. And I picked up like 3,000 followers in like that day or something. I'm like, oh, geez, there's something to this guy. Um, so that was really, really actually quite fun because it was so out of the blue. I think if I would have met him in the middle of some of the more intense projects, it would have been such a different dynamic to the conversation. It would have been all, all shop talk. And, and that sucks. This was just, I don't think we even talked about watches. These people at the table next to us had a huge gray Weimaran or dog sitting at the table. So I think it was just he and I talking about dogs for a couple of hours. Who knows? And every time that I've run into him at a show, it's actually really quite refreshing because he is, this was maybe about four or five years ago, you know, sort of the 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 Mac daddy of the sort of taste making of the industry. And I, as a complete nobody, really was of no quote unquote benefit or use to him. But he was just the most sincerely nice guy ever. Always made time. We sat and had a scotch or something and just kind of bullshitted about life. Super nice. Um, and that's, yeah, that's actually probably the first, the first guy that I ever met, kind of that was connected to the industry. <clears throat> the first... Um, Brand people I got to know was actually um, Bruno and Carlos of uh, Bell and Ross, mm -hmm. which is, again, a, a pretty nice kind of table to sort of wobble into. Um, got to know them sort of socially really quite well. I won a, a photo contest um, through there. I think it was through their Facebook page and I actually got invited out to Paris to their annual soiree with all their sort of French Bell and Ross enthusiasts and stuff and just got irresponsibly liquored in like, you know, this crazy Napoleonic military club thing in the middle of downtown Paris. Um, yeah, and just sort of was constantly getting to know all these industry people that I didn't have anything to offer yet. I was just a guy that made rings. So you had a Bell & Ross, though. That's how you bought yeah, a photo Yeah, that was the first one that I, the first watch that I ever bought was a Bell & Ross. And why bought, did you buy that? Because uh, it's effing cool. Yeah? I, it, 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 that's kind of all I was looking for with it is it was just something cool. I got a bit of money from my from my grandparents uh, when when they passed away about two thousand seven two thousand eight, and I'd always wanted like a really cool mechanical watch. And as a broke student, there's no way that I was going to pony up cash for this. So I, I forget how I got on to Bell and Ross, but I think it was through um, I was always talking watches with my buddy Matthias Huebag that I did my grad project with, and he had started talking about Bell and Ross, and I kind of looked them up and went, 
oh, this is exactly what I want. It's just, it's so tool. It's so industrial, you know, and now that I'm old and you're like, I can read the time from across the room on it. That's a bit of a benefit. But I would say the entire reason I'm sitting here all started because taking dorky wristies of my Bell and Ross watch and then through that was called the Bravo community um, through that kind of getting exposure to the right people. And then um, Carlos would start kind of recommending me to other brands. And I would start getting emails saying, hi, Carlos Rosillo said I should talk to you. You're the guy that does all the goofy, weird materials and all this. And it, 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 a led to B, B led to C, and then, God, 10 years later almost? Holy crap. So it actually did start because you bought a watch for yourself with your yes. own money. Yeah. And then you just started building a network of contacts. You met the right people at the right time, so it sounds? It was, it was pre-Instagram. You know, it was an actual online forum. I mean, how the internet was made of wood. I mean, it, it was proper old school. You would have to make posts. You know, James has posted four new pictures and it was way too many Instagram filters and all this kind of dorky stuff on it. But it that's where it all came from. Very interesting. What about you, Anders? When did you first encounter the watch industry? Well, this guy. Really? <laughs> yeah. J- James I'm so was, sorry to hear uh, that. But. <laughs> James, was, James was the first, you know, guy within the industry that uh, really I got in contact with. Yeah. Hashtag and, uh, set the bar low. <laughs> Well, you know, I've I, I I talked to people, manufacturers and stuff like that before um, in the Swiss uh, in Swiss Switzerland, but uh, like the the first like real uh, contact within the industry, you could say, was James. But how were you exposed to watchmaking originally? Was it something that you knew from? Your parents or from your friends or did you discover it yourself in a similar way that James did? Not at all. Like uh, when me and Simon actually started the company, I was kind of getting into watches and he was like the most most knowledgeable uh, guy uh, I knew uh, with a collection of watches. So we talked a lot about watches and design and stuff like that. And then we went to Salon QP and I think it was the, you know, every year and the uh, then I think on the second year we were there, we met James. And I was like, I, I've seen that guy somewhere on Instagram. And I was like, let's go talk to him and, you know, drink some beers. And <laughs> Funny how the beer really does help in these situations. It to build does, those actually. It, it was actually really quite luck that we did meet because the day before we met, um, I had like 80,000 euros of watches get stolen out of my booth. Yeah, because you had 80,000 liters of beer, that's why. <laughs> no, I, I had borrowed watches from brands. I was too scared to be drinking. It's like borrowing your mom's car, you know, how slow you drive it kind oh, of really? thing. Oh, really? You were sober when they got stolen? Yeah. So it was a judge? No, or? it was overnight. I, I closed things up. I had the keys to the security case with me, came back in the morning, and they were wide open. Inside Yikes. job. Hey. But I actually wasn't going to come back the next night because I was so furious and sad and just defeated that my crap got stolen yeah then you guys came in and hi hi (laughs) (laughs) the rest is history but i mean it it does actually make a difference like the environment in which you meet people and in that relaxed let's have a drink together kind of environment you really can do some of the best work i i always used to say when i was at fratello and before that when i was visiting geneva watch days or watches and wonders that my best work actually takes place in the tent in the evening. After all the formal meetings are done, when you're there and you're reconnecting with people, yes, you've seen them throughout the day, you've sat across the table from them, you've seen the novelties, you've taken your notes, you've, you know, committed to write articles about them, whatever. And then you see them when they've had three or four glasses of champagne and you start having a laugh together, you start talking about dogs or hats or planes and you realize you have some other things in common which bond you instantly because we all know at these events especially that we have watches in common you don't accidentally rock up to a watch fair very often you know you go there deliberately so having that opportunity to really like get inside somebody's head and like form a relationship is the most important thing and obviously it's a vital design tool drink but that's it's a vital design tool to actually be able to you know i mean it sounds so corny you don't want to sort of do the jerry Maguire. i'm the king of the living room kind of thing but there's some spectacular designers out there that you could not handle more than a five-minute conversation with before you're just, you know, 
done. Whereas somebody that if you're sitting at the pub and everyone's being loud and goofy and anecdotal and stuff, that's when everyone lets their guard down and starts talking about stuff that's maybe not 100% related to the project at hand. And that's how you start to flesh out the, flesh out the idea. Yeah, every, so every project I've done before I met you guys started in either the, the I met, I met, I met, I met <laughs> Stepan Sarpanava in the men's room at Salon QP. That is a dangerous place to run. That's a dangerous place. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, interestingly, you know Stephen McDonald, right? Because you've worked for MBNF. Uh, we didn't even make it through five minutes of this episode Crazy. without that coming up again. But Stephen and I knew each other when he was working with Bremont and stayed friendly for a short while after that. And he's an incredibly intelligent man. And the way he looks at the world and watch movements is like few others. But he doesn't really love talking shop all the time. He's quite reserved. He likes to do his business, do it as well as he thinks it can be done, and then just, you know, head to the pub and have a pint. And it was in a pub somewhere near the Saatchi Gallery. I can't remember where it was. It was only about 200 meters away. We sat down in the corner of the pub and we were just drinking pints. And at that point, we started opening up and chatting more about life. And then on the back of that convivial relationship we've established... We then got back into watches and the fluidity and the passion with which he spoke about it after those walls had come down was noticeable. So yeah, there can be some guys who when you first meet them, especially like the really incredible intellects of the industry who aren't maybe the most immediately arresting or they're not going to try and charm your socks off like the head of sales from XYZ major brand in America. Like they'll, they'll have you eaten out of the palm of their hand within five seconds. But if you persevere with these guys and you find them in an environment that they feel comfortable, then what can come from that is at least like a good friendship and sometimes, of course, even more. But since you've had these experiences of meeting people in the watch industry, would you regard yourselves now or still maybe in your case as a watch guy. Like, do you think like beyond the brand of Arcanaut, you're a watch guy? I mean, do you collect watches? Do you have any other watches that are of note? Uh, I actually first started collecting watches like recently. Okay. And and because I didn't have, have the money to do it basically before. Like I have my own watches and then everything else has gone into Arcanaut. But now I can start to do it. So I wouldn't call myself a watch watch guy, like, uh, but I would call myself you know, a design guy or uh, a owner of a watch brand. But I don't know if I see myself as, you know, I, I see other collectors as, as, you know, on a pedestal almost, yeah, you know, interesting. In, in another way. You know, I'm, I've, I feel it's interesting to talk to uh, collectors and I see them as, you know, almost a separate species and then, you know, talk to them to learn. Like, uh, but I, I think I am probably a watch guy because i think a lot about watches and you know but um but that's kind of refreshing it's kind of refreshing that you're not an absolute diehard watch guy and i i think that kind of shows in the process in in developing arcanaut pieces you know if you if you have four or five car designers and sit down and everyone's got a bag of markers and you say what's next year going to look like everyone's going to start drawing cars with four wheels and like how exciting is that but because you're coming at it more from a, especially a Scandinavian Nordic design perspective, like it or not, that's that's going to have colored your, that's your filter that you're viewing this all through. Instead of, don't step on toes, but instead of another person who grew up in Switzerland, another person from the Jura who can talk about the history of that, that story has been told very well, but many times. I want to hear what, just like you're saying with the Nordic food movement, I want to hear what fucking Copenhagen thinks about this. I couldn't care less what Zurich thinks about things right now. This is what's interesting. Before I ask you the Hashtag same question. Zurich. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Zurich. Um, we've got some lovely friends in Zurich. We, we love Zurich. You said that you're interested in talking to collectors. You're interested in to hear their feedback. But what kind of feedback are you most interested in? Is it their collecting habits or their collecting motivations or their thoughts on design or their interpretation of big brand messaging? What is it that piques your interest? It, it It's really like around why they buy a watch. Like what, 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 what sets, you know, the, the purchasing process uh, in motion and what's the feeling they get and what, 
how do they convince themselves this is the right thing to to do? Do you realize that throughout that explanation, you just did the old why, the what, and the how in that order? You actually said why, what, and how. And the why, obviously, is where you start with the design. And that's what you're interested in from the collectors. And then the what, what is it they actually buy? And then the how do they go about it? It's interesting. Just subconsciously, you picked out exactly the pathway that we use to design yeah. watches. That's true. But I think it also, in it, you know, the reason why I'm interested in it is because it's not just to design watches. It's because I'm also interested in, you know, we're, we're testing out a lot of different things last year and this year with the watch buying uh, process, right. you know, and doing new things with that. Because I think if you want to be the most creative watch brand in the world, which we want to be the most innovative watch brand in the world, then you need to experiment with things that are not just new watch designs, but yeah. really a new purchasing experience or new yeah. purchasing experiences. Um, and that's what, what I'm really interested in is yeah. like, okay, how can we reinvent that you know, experience is, and it, is there something in how the collectors start the journey or how things that they want to try out or experience that other brands don't see? And that is the things that I'm really, really interested in, in trying to see if we can do something different. Yeah, that process is incredible. Like the why it has to come from the heart and the what has to be spectacular. But we focus so much on how can the how be revolutionary? That's a different way of looking at things. The way that we communicate and engage with our audience is, I think, one of the strongest strings to Arkanaut's bow, which doesn't get spoken about that often, not even by us. You know, we have the communication strategy, obviously, but the sales strategy, like that enables us to be more creative and to do things with the why and the what. And I I'm extremely proud of us being able to experiment with that every time we go through a new release cycle, having some new ideas where we say, hey, what if we sold a watch like this? Not what if the watch was like this, but what if we sold it like this? That's fascinating. Yeah. So for you, are you a watch guy? I mean, you've got a collection that now would put many collections worldwide to shame for whatever reason, but... Okay, look, how about you keep quiet about that part, okay? Yeah. All right, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I I would definitely put myself in the same in the same camp as a uh, young Anders over here that I'm, I'm into it for the design of things. Uh, I, I absolutely don't look at watches for any type of financial uh, esteem value mm -hmm. or any kind of, Oh, well I like this one, but I know that this other model will sell for 10% more in 20. I couldn't give less of a crap if I tried. Mm. In fact, I actively go out of my way to avoid that. Um, I, I become a watch guy but definitely in my own way, um, I get completely put off. And this almost goes back to what we're always complaining about, how I'm the only person in the company that's stupid enough to read the comments when we get a feature or review. <laughs> I just shut up. Just let me do it. And, um, and there's always, you know, I mean, not even with Arcanauts, but other sort of more, more, more expensive brands that I've done where someone goes, well, why would I buy that for that price? I could get five of, and they start listing off all these Rolex, like serial numbers and license plates. I'm like, go ahead. I, I, they're nice watches. Rock on buddy. Like, I don't want somebody to buy one of our watches because somebody projected that it might be worth 10% over retail next year. Like that would, that, that would actually make me sad mm -hmm. if that's why somebody bought something. Cause it means they're totally circumventing what, it's going to sound kind of corny to say the magic that we're putting into it. Yeah. That's the only thing I need out of this company, not money, not either, but just if we get to do things like the Hovender, mm -hmm. if I get to wake up and do that every day for the rest of my life, that's a friggin' charmed life. Yeah. And that's what I want. And the watches that I do have are, are ones that I feel somebody has kind of touched a nerve. Someone's done something that related to me or that I can kind of see a bit of my own, whatever you want to call it in that. Um, the, the, the nuts and bolts of it is a lot of the ones that I have are watches that I've worked on. Yeah. So I've got the most self-serving masturbatory collection of watches in modern history. Because even some ones that I have, you know, I, I have a, um, a, a very nice uh, Laurent Ferrier 
that sort of come into the collection recently. And I absolutely love it. It's spectacular. It's so poetic. I had nothing to do with it. So every time I put it on, it's like... Uh, oh, really? So that's what you feel? Because, uh, you, I mean, you were very... Uh, I'm just that small of a man, yes. Very generous with that Lauren Ferrier because I guess you don't have a personal connection to it, really. Like, as soon as you got it, you handed it over to me. And I had it for a month or six weeks or something. And Well, because I know that your connection with watches is very different from Anders, and Anders is, 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 and very different from mine. So I, I was more interested in seeing what your reaction to it would be almost than my own. Um, and, and there's actually a couple more pieces that are sort of going to be popping into the collection the next little bit, and they're definitely more of the artistic indie side. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, nothing against these brands, I don't plan on popping up a Patek or a... FP Journe or, or any of these, I just nothing against them, but they just I, I just don't get horny about them. A loomed Nautilus though, a black badger Nautilus. Yeah, I'm Nothing. totally full of crap because I would be so excited about that, <laughs> that would and be I would good, sell right? myself out. You would hear the sonic yeah. boom from over in Dresden. <laughs> but um, no, it's just all, all I want out of this is just some entertainment. Oh, that wow. th that's as high as I set the bar, my friend. You're giving a lot back as well, obviously, with the way that you go about it. It's always a good thing. Um, you mentioned the comments online, and this leads into a question I had written <laughs> down before me. It says, is feedback important to you? And if so, what kind of feedback is the most important? What you should do or what you shouldn't do? So that's the question I'm asking. Is it more important when somebody comes up to you from across a room or yells down a comment section oh you should be doing this xyz or is it more important when someone says i don't think you should follow this established path or you know follow this trend that i like i like someone saying um you know oh wow it's another piece that follows this like if we put out a, a patina a patina bronze watch or something and everyone goes oh geez you guys also are doing one of these that's kind of a legit response mm. um and if someone just says, this is ugly as crap, that also I'm okay with. That That's just a completely sort of personal response. Mm -hmm. What gets under my skin, here's James's kryptonite, is when you put out something that we have literally bled on for months and months and leveraged our lives to produce, and within five seconds of posting a picture of it, someone goes, oh, you know what you should have done? <laughs> And that, that just makes me want to just, just go kill Bill on everybody mm. because it's so easy to look at something and from first blush go, boy, if I did this, I would have made it, you know, X, Y, but you didn't. Yeah. You didn't. So piss off. Yeah. So I would say, do I find constructive or do I find feedback useful? Honestly, I'm going to take the jackass answer and say, no. Okay. I need to be completely shielded from it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where you two come into the picture, barking at me every time I start shooting back in the comments. I'm sorry. Um, whatever my completely diva-esque little creative process is, it doesn't handle uh, bitchy comments well. Right, but... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quite embarrassed to say, but... Let's be real. And the reason why we say stay away from it is because the comments that draw your ire more than any are just roundly idiotic. It's like, such troll go, bait. Oh, this watch would be good at 500 euros. I'm like, of course it would be fucking good at 500 yeah. euros. So the Empire State Building, but it costs <laughs> if you quite can, a lot to build. If you, you know? can make our watch for 500 bucks, welcome to Arcanaut, yeah, pal. Well, the crazy thing is, I'm this fired. Is, this is something where it, it does wind me up as well, because I just think, sometimes I'm glad the internet exists. And I said this the other day because somebody criticized men wearing this Bulgari Serpenti, which I absolutely love. I said, I'm glad it exists so that idiots can make a fool of themselves to a broad audience. But you have to be such a <laughs> moron to like chime in with a comment like that without even engaging your brain for a second. Because, okay, firstly, obviously, okay, not obviously, maybe it's not obvious because these people don't know what they're talking about. They're sitting behind a keyboard criticizing anybody that does something mm. rather than actually doing it themselves. But if they go, okay, this watch should be good for 500 euros. It's like, okay, well, it literally cannot be made for 500 euros. So let's just up the ante here and say, 
let's say we could make a watch that retails for 4,000 euros. Let's say we could make it for 3,000 euros mm. or 2,500 euros or 2,000 euros, however you want to split the calculation. Let's say that's what it costs to make a watch that retails at that amount, which, by the way, is not generally the calculation that most watch brands apply to the cost of making something and the retail of it. Let's say that's true. You can't make one of those watches for 2,000 or 2,500 or 3,000. If you want to make one of those watches, well, firstly, you'd have to buy at least 30 cases that would then sit on a shelf or 29 of them would sit on a shelf gathering dust. This is why Giles started Schofield. Right. Because he wanted his own watch, but he realized he couldn't just make one watch for himself. So he made a couple of pieces, 300 pieces limited each, because that's the effective price break. And there you go. It was the exact same calculation with the, shout out Max Booser, um, with the the HMX Black Badger Edition. Thank you very much. Uh, pause for applause. Um, it's the second what, time in 20 minutes we've hit that one. That's already, crazy. So. <laughs> um, when that one came out, it was, you know, 50, between 55 and 60,000 Swiss francs, which for me is a truckload of money. For an MBNF, it was their entry level watch. That was pretty cool. And I liked the fact that I got to do the entry level piece. That, that excited me more than something that was $8 million covered in diamonds, whatever. But people started grumping about the movement. It had a very heavily modified, but I think it was based on a Salita movement. Okay. I couldn't have into The watch has my logo on it. I couldn't tell you what the movement is because honestly, between us and whoever's listening, I don't care. It's not what I get excited about. But people said, oh, how come you put this crappy movement in there? And, and Max says, well, because we wanted the watch to be 54,000 Swiss francs. If you wanted this movement, we could do that, but the watch will cost 84. Hmm. That's the economy of scale that you're touching on a lot of the time. We wanted to have it at this price range. That's how it works. We could make it with a sexier movement, but you don't get that for free. Yeah. So it just it just shows, I, I thought it was quite a nice way of handling quite a dickish comment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't, somebody driving a three series BMW, don't say, oh man, but if you had this engine in it, mm. what well, we do, it's called the five series. Yeah. Go buy one. Yeah. You know. Yep, 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 yep. Fair point. What about you? What do you think about, I mean, feedback from outside of the company, should we say, not from collectors, but from a, a wider community that isn't directly connected to you? I would say... Your mom's comments don't count. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out, Andrew's She's mom. She's our greatest critic. Um, She's lovely. Throwing shade on Instagram. I think if you have skin in the game, if, if you need to, like, people who just, comment something without anonymously on some post online don't have any skin in the game not even their identity right mm. so it's it could be other brand owners it could be you know people who are jealous people who actually want the watch but just can't afford it or you know you didn't never know but i would say those kinds of comments are, don't really you know care to even give a thought I mean, but you've you've always said, right, that staying removed from the noise exactly, is exactly. important. Yeah, I, I, I don't read the comments. you got to teach me how to do that, buddy. Put away your phone. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, but comments and feedback from customers, people who actually have uh, skin in the game, I think is important because that's what's going to take a brand from something that's small and to something that's a big community that lives outside of us. Because I want our customers to feel, that's also part of why we're doing a podcast like this, is to feel, okay, they're part of something. This mm. is part of something bigger than us free. And I want, that that's people who work, like Philip or, you know, everybody who works in the company, that they also feel they can come with feedback, come with comments or something on things because I'm not all knowing. I, I'm not like, okay, I'm going to know everything about making the watch or designing the watch. And if people have a better idea than me, I'll recognize it. Mm. Like, And I want people to feel that. But if it's just some random dude online, well, it's like, you know, I don't care. And if they're not, comp it, it, it's almost more of a personality barometer, how somebody comments on these things. If they're not commenting and saying, Arcanaut sucks, 
they're going to be over on a car forum saying, oh my God, you're stupid enough that you bought the 2020 model, blah, blah. Or they're going to be commenting on some girl's picture on Instagram saying fat, you know, or some kind of just yeah. toxic shit like this. And it, yeah, trolls. Trolls. Okay. All right. So this isn't to say that founding a watch brand is the be all and end all of the watch industry or even a barometer of how much you're into watches. But you've worked with many, many brands now. Yeah, have a contact list as long as your arm. You've never founded a watch brand. You basically had zero contacts <laughs> and you founded a watch brand. So what never encouraged you to start your own brand and what made you confident enough to go into it basically blind? Start with you. Jesus. Why have you never founded a watch brand? Well, that's a good question. This is a good question for like four beers into the night. Well, we can revisit on the wild episode that we do later. <laughs> Stay tuned for think, that, by the way. I think because of the way I came into the industry, because I quite literally Forrest Gumped my way in, and that's a patent pending term, um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of showed up at a party I wasn't invited to and ended up... Still doing that, man. You know, singing at How someone's wedding. How did you know we were here today? <laughs> I, I saw the smoke. Um, and I heard the crying from inside. I... I because I came into it kind of through the back door, not as a legitimate watchmaker. I, d I don't have the watchmaking education that you yourself have, or I don't have the, the watch design background that uh, uh, Eric Giraud and these kind of people have, ob 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 obviously. Thank you very much. Um, I always saw myself as an outsider, and I think I feel still like I need to protect being an outsider. Sort of like we've said with Anders a few times, how he goes out of his way not to belong to every single watch blog on the planet and not read five watch magazines a month because that starts to affect your filter through which you're viewing the industry. I, I'm kind of the same way. I, I, need, I needed to be fluid and be able to skip around in the backyard sprinkling pixie dust on whatever caught my fancy. And whenever things got to be heavy or not fun, I would pick up another project and have that really, like the first 10, 20% of the project is where you get peak James because I'm just up on the table with no shirt on, throwing out ideas all over the place. That's what I do. I've seen that. When it's, I know, I'll, I'll start doing sit-ups. But the last 10%, which is where you guys keep us from going bankrupt, you'll notice the audible silence when I kind of push back from the table and go, I, I need to not be a part of this because I will cock it up in the most epic way possible. So, so sort of finding, well, that's my 20 minute uh, soliloquy on that, but um, keeping myself mobile and fluid, I think is the best way that I could find my little creative bubble worked. So that's why it's so surprising that this has worked as well as it has, if it has, um, because I'd never worked with anybody. Mm. I, I've never worked with a single other person that's obvious, before yeah. you two chowder heads <laughs> came along. <laughs> that was good. Thanks, buddy. Um, but, you know, you kind of play the role that you've always played in other brands. You're, you're a co-owner of the company. You're an integral part of the brand identity. And yet, because of the work you do and the way in which you do it, it's almost like you're collaborating on every piece, you know? Yeah. And I, I don't know how much I like that anymore. Um, well, you're gonna have to get into spreadsheets if you don't like it. Oh, for crying out loud. Okay. I'll <laughs> shut up. And yes, I'll get you another coffee in just a minute, sir. Um, boy, I don't know that that's, that kind of gets under the skin and sort of gets, gets a little deep on that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I let me come back to that. Okay, later, think about it for later, a little while. Yeah. Let's move over to Anders and we'll, uh, we'll ask Anders exactly why you felt you could do it. I don't know. Uh, Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think, you know, you need to be, when you start a company, you need to be a bit naive and then also believe in, in a vision, something that's more long-term than just, okay, next year we'll sell 100 watches. But just think little bit outside of that okay if we can keep this alive for 10 years 20 years 30 years what it could become mm. and then if you need to create the context that you don't have you need to find somebody uh, 
or a group of people who are better than you at that. And that's actually true for everything that the only thing you need to do actually to start any company is just to find people who are better than you at other things and then sell them on that 30 year vision, not anything else that that's it. And you would rather own, you know, 1% of a success than a hundred percent of a failure. So it's better to go out and say, okay, I'm not good at this, this, and this. Let me find somebody who's better and then convince them that this vision is something they could be a part of, which I did with you two. Yeah, especially. It feels like I need to change my answer because I sound like an arrogant jackass now. (laughs) And by doing that, I I basically bought you guys' contacts Mm. with my vision. Yeah. And what I got was your structure and a solid base plate from which to jump off of and do all the crazy wonky wonky stuff that in theory could have been done somewhere else. But I think because Arcanaut has become a home, happy to say, it it sort of works. And I think the more that, like we talked about before, about you coming into the more creative side of things or Rob coming in with his half-drunken delusional ideas... The, the roles that we found, like, this works. This is, like, the Ocean's Eleven super team. Right. You got the guy that drives the van. You got the computer guy. You got the guy that, you know, the, the, the acrobat guy or whatever. And when you start bumping around through different roles, it might very well work. But it sort of changes the dynamic a little bit. I don't think that I could do what I'm doing at a different brand because I would start crapping up whatever they already have in place. And because you've been so generous with Arcanaut as an entity, that's why it works. That's why we can make watches out of muscle shells or coffee or, you know. Yeah, I mean. Deep fried air. Really what I'm sort of insinuating by sort of saying that the role you play enables you to remain um, free and independent. Yeah, minded absolutely. Is because you're kind of the heart of the brand. Maybe you're the head, maybe I'm the brawn. You know, and that's the way that it works. The heart of the Ghostbusters. The heart of the Ghostbusters. Race dance. And, you know, that's that's how it works for us because, well, we're a small team. If we had 30 people, then, you know, it might be the case that we'd need to play more traditional roles. But there are no rules when you start a new brand or a new entity. Convincing 20 people to take a radical direction change is... Like a, almost like a military organization kind of thing. The three of us sitting around a couple empty pints, boom, pull the U-brake, take a left turn, see where it goes. Yeah, exactly. That's, and actually finding the value and the benefit and the advantage in being three dudes doing this and not having you know, all these different levels of mid-level directional manager, blah, blah, whatever. If, if we find an idea that kind of smells good, we're like, yeah. I mean, you said it, before... In your previous life as a as a as a sole collaborator rather than a co brand owner, that you want to remain mobile or maybe agile is that word. Like you're within this company, you're still able to do that because of the way Arcanaut is built around it. Absolutely correct, sir. Right. You've got it. Somewhere else it wouldn't work, right? Like you say, you know, you went to Omega and you tried to do what you're doing without like a sixty page properly color coded like justification for it. They should do a special edition of the of the Speedmaster. Wouldn't that be something? That's a great idea. Oh I, seriously. Well, I'm seriously. not sure the community would go for that to be honest. It seems a bit too radical. Pretty, pretty stodgy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh anyway, uh if they did a black badger one that would be worthwhile though. I have to say that so you know you know where we are. <laughs> okay. So James just talk a little bit more about the importance of a network that you established through pints and then partnerships and then more pints and then more partnerships to the trajectory of your career. Could you have done it in a different way, do you think? No. No, I don't think so. I think I am here through the good graces of several other people and a thousand percent believe in that. You feel you deserve your position though, right? In the industry or do you still feel like I, a bit I've of earned it after the fact. Yeah? I, I, I had the equivalent of basically somebody pulling you up on stage and sitting you down next to Sinatra and saying, you, sh- you should take a listen to this guy. He's, he's doing something kind of cool there. Mm-hmm. And that's 
Simon Cudd. That's 100% Max Booser. That's uh, Stepan Sarpaneva as well. I mean, all those Giles. Fuck yeah, all those early collaborations. Because I wasn't a watch guy. I mean, I almost saw myself as my, and this sounds so Kickstarter, my job was to disrupt the watch industry because I wasn't a watch guy. So I was using goofy materials that people hadn't heard of. And I basically had made rings and people would say, well, what if we use that goofy material on this watch? What would it do? Well, who knows? Let's find out. And it really struck a nerve with a lot of people. So like before, project A led to project B led to project C. It's, it's not that I had to tooth and nail claw my way through the masses. Um, you know, like sort of Wolf of Wall Street where 5,000 people are squeezing in the elevator with their resume in their hand. I didn't have to do that. I had the pleasure of picking up the phone and having someone like Giles saying, I, I, I see what you're doing out there. there there's something kind of cool here. Let's, let's chat on it. Do you think that the kind of career trajectory you've enjoyed is more or less likely to be possible for someone else today? Mm. Interesting. Because you really hit the ground running at the right time. It was the right place at the right time. Right. Uh, And just Mm. by being kind of an early adopter on Instagram and sort of the the visual leapfrog that that was. Um, Sorry to cut you off yet again, (laughs) Anders. I'll be quick. Even before Instagram, I mean, really, the, the basic levels on Twitter, I, I, I was in a group with a couple of friends, and it was this uh, hashtag FF, Follow Friday. So a couple of my buddies, every Friday, they would sort of do like a, a shout out to three or four or five people that they thought were doing kind of cool stuff. And this was, again, through my buddy Simon. And he was good pals with a dude named Charlie Stockwell in London, who was an unbelievable custom Harley Davidson builder. I have never ridden a motorcycle in my entire life. I couldn't even tell you how to turn one on. But he saw the stuff that I was doing, shown to him through my buddy Simon. And he started, hashtag, follow Friday, check out this Black Badger guy. And at at that point, I was just doing kind of like little bits and pieces. But through him, I got this massive interest from custom motorcycle people Mm -hmm. and the car industry and all this kinds of crap, which led to A to B to C to D. So it was it was definitely a right place at the right time because this was when Twitter was kind of evolving into away from just text into the sort of more physical image based uh, reality of Instagram. Now, of course, we're past that into crappy TikTok videos of teenage girls and stuff. Um, would it happen to somebody else? I it it would it would have a different path. I don't think it would be as fun because I I literally got snuck in the back door of some pretty damn cool parties that I wasn't invited to mm. and and God bless him for it because I don't think I would be here without those. Do you think that's largely to thank with your tangential association at best with the watch industry? I mean, it wasn't your field. Like, you, you no. were a materials maestro. I mean, look look at Romaric Andre, second, second. Yep. He's maybe the only corollary I can think of in terms of a, a multi-brand collaborator. Yep. But he obviously focused on watchmaking from the very beginning. That was like not an accident. He designed hands for watches that could be fitted after the fact. Yeah. So it wasn't like he was making those hands for anything else before. Yes, he was an artist, of course, but it's slightly different. Like there was, there was more of a, a focus and a, a rabid desire to run through the industry on his part. Whereas you managed to go in very organically and everything seemed to sort of build around the relationships that you cultivated. And that's different from, I think, the way that someone's approaching it these days. But I, I think... Sorry, go, Jay, ahead. Sorry, go ahead, buddy. I think, James, you would actually be successful in almost any industry. Any can, you call, indu- can you call my dad and tell him that? Any industry that, that has something to do with design or cre- where you need to be creative. But most of all, I think actually... A, a, a skill that you have that a lot of people don't have, that I certainly don't have, and that's really unique, is that your your ability to connect with people, something that we also touched upon a little bit earlier, connect with people really, really quickly, which you also mentioned uh, uh, in one of our other uh, episodes, where 
you what what actually gets you going is uh, telling a joke or yeah. mm. you know being creative around that and that is actually a, an ability that a lot of people a, a skill that a lot of people would like to have but i think you have it in such to such a, an extreme degree that you could be successful in almost any industry getting contacts because you're the guy that people want to uh, to talk to that people gravitate to in a room and that's not a skill that you can learn in school it's not a, a skill you can learn anywhere actually and that's you know i think also one of the big parts that have made you successful maybe the biggest part because it is when you see you uh, at for example when we're at a watch fair or something you can definitely see that it's like a black hole you know yeah. mm-hmm. everything circles around you so <laughs> Jeez. but that's true it's I, it's i mean it's an industry of airs and graces and you have absolutely none like you just yourself you know you like to be liked we know this like it's important to you to be liked but you are likable so it's easy to kind of get to the goal you know you meet somebody a lot of people in this industry want to impress upon that person who they are whereas when you meet somebody <laughs> you are interested in them and you're like oh hey i'm james like you don't say oh hi. i know you've mentioned max Busser three or four times in this episode but you don't lead with hi i'm black badger you may know me from the list of credentials have never and will never introduce myself as black badger if my if my brand was called fucking ABC Design, I don't think I would be here. It's because <laughs> hello, I'm ABC Design on the first Ellen Ross <laughs> forum. Exactly, no one says, "Oh hi, I'm I'm uh, Joe's custom pickups or something." You'd say, "Hi, I'm I'm Joe." Well, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that Dwayne Johnson for a while would have introduced himself as a rock because his brand was a personality. A rock. I, <laughs> I am like That's the, the Dwayne Johnson hello, of the I'm rock, a rock industry. <laughs> <laughs> Not the rock. I'm the most electrifying man in sports oh, entertainment. Still is. Um, you know what? It, it actually comes from a very sincere internal place, if I can sort of break it down here. Mm-hmm. Um, be socially fearless. That is the most paramount skill I would give to anybody starting any kind of a startup. Be socially fearless. Walk into a room and just be okay. Stand in front of, you know, I, I did my TED Talk. I cried in front of 1,500 people because I was talking about um, yeah, like how I had a bad speech impediment when I was a kid and we moved around a lot and that you always have a social spotlight on you being a bit of a weirdo. And as soon as you're okay with that, you are fucking unstoppable. Sincerely. How are you with social cues? Like in a, when you meet somebody new, for example, like, and if a person's a bit cold towards you or they're like, they're giving off. I just mentioned their breasts. <laughs> That's normally a good rule of thumb, I suppose. But if somebody's given off the vibe that, you know, they don't want to talk to you or that they're not interested in you, do you respond to that and leave? Or do you just sort of carry on until they get on board? It it depends. Um, Usually I would say I'm I'm very sensitive and very attuned to social cues because I've known some people that are not. And it's something that just like a splinter, it just makes me nuts when you can see somebody and you're like, Oh God, just read the room, buddy. Mm. Like you're on fire and you don't even know it. Um, and then other times I, I kind of take it as a bit of, that's my, that's my superpower. That's when I turn into the Hulk is that if, if you're giving me nothing, I will have for my own pure enjoyment. Yeah. 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 Just just make your life absolute hell for the next 10 minutes (laughs) purely so that I can come back and tell you guys about it later. It's like, yeah, no, I made the marketing director for Brightling cry. (laughs) Just, you know, pick, pick a random brand or something. I just, I absolutely love it. Um, socially fearless, be okay with any situation and just don't feel like you need to hide behind your credentials. Don't feel like you need to hide behind the fact that you, well, your your mom's fancy car or whatever fancy watch you're wearing. Just be likable. That's that's my whole shtick. Literally, once people figure this out, you don't need me anymore. 
Well, on that bombshell, I think we're going to wrap up this episode. That was a very interesting chat about the importance of contacts in building a watch brand and obviously Is establishing we were careers about? around and about Jeez. that fact, yeah. Turn, turned into a, a bit of a biography, but I was very fascinated right, by that. No, it was wonderful. We're going to be back soon with some more content from The Pip. Thank you for spending time with us today talking about the important factors of establishing a global watch brand. We'll speak to you soon. Until then, stay safe and keep on ticking.